Lemmy, listen. Huh? That noise. Can't you hear it? Yes. That's the same noise we heard just as we was coming into land. The noise Jeff said called Jeff, him to, to... Jeff, can you hear me? Jeff! Leave me alone, Doc. Can't you see I'm tired? Tired? What do you mean? I want to sleep, but it's warm. Jeff, it's not tiredness that makes you feel sleepy. It's the cold. I must lie down. I must lie down. No, Jeff, don't. For heaven's sakes, don't lie down. Oh, sleep. It is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. I? If you're off me, you're up the pole. Jet, do you hear me? Don't go to sleep. And Mitch, what about Mitch? Is he asleep and all? Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. And last time to start knitting, what's he talking about? Jet, listen to me. You're nowhere near the ship. There is no orange light. You must find your way back, do you hear? Jet, do you hear me? He's not answering. He must be asleep already. They both must be. If they are, Lemmy, out there in that bitter cold, it'll be the end of both of them. Then we'd better go out and look for him. That's what I intend doing. Frank should have one of the transport trucks over here within 45 minutes. Keep calling Jet on the radio, will you? Yeah. Meanwhile, I'll get my suit on and be all ready for Frank when he comes. Hello, flagship. Number one calling. Hello, Frank. Let me hear. Truck's all ready. Will you send me a direction signal, Lemmy? Fog's still as thick as pea soup over here. Yes, mate. DF transmitter on. You better check your own set before you start moving. We don't want to lose you and all. Any reply from Jet yet? No, Frank. Ah. All right, Lemmy. I'll call you just as soon as I'm in the truck. Right. Did you hear all that, Doc? Yes, Lemmy. Let's hope Jet and Mitch are still where they were when we last heard from them. If they've wandered further away, our chances of finding them are pretty slim. Okay, Doc, I'll let you out now. Thanks, Lemmy. Main door. Contact. <laughs> Can you see the truck, Doc? Uh, no, not the truck, but I can see its headlight. Now, wait a minute. You're sure it is its light? Jet and Mitch thought they were seeing our light, but they weren't. Frank, switch it off, will you? It's off. Now switch on again. There you are. That's it, all right. Okay, Lemmy, let down the ladder. Ladder, contact. About to descend to ground. Touching down now... Now making my way over to the truck. The airlock's open, Doc. You can step straight in. Thanks, Frank, but I'll ride outside. Start her up and let's get going. All right. Here we go. Good luck, boys. Thanks, Lemmy. We'll need it. Hello, Lemmy. Yes, Doc. How are we doing? Well, the latest fix puts you off a mile northwest of number one, bearing 226 degrees. Then we must be pretty close to where they were when we last heard from them. Then slow down, Frank. We don't want to risk running over them. What's visibility like out there? Uh, about ten yards, Lemmy. The fog seems to be a lot thinner over here. Well, it's still as thick as it ever was over here. And it seems to be getting dark. And, oh, hey, Doc, hadn't you better get inside that truck? I'm not cold yet, Lemmy. Well, you watch it, boy. We don't want you to freeze. If it gets too cold, I'll slip into the airlock and warm up. I say, Doc, the fog's definitely thinning. Headlights shining way ahead now. So I can see. Hey, Frank, hold it. Stop. Stop the truck. Project the light down a little. All right. That's it. See, there, directly in front of us. Yes, it's them, all in a heap on the ground. I'll go on ahead, Frank. You come as quickly as you can make it. Hey, Lemmy, are you listening? We found them. Yes, Doc. I heard you. Nearly up to them now. Hey, Jet, Mitch, can you hear me? This is Matthews. Jet, Jet! Well, Doc? Uh, they don't reply, Lemmy. They just lie here, motionless. Frank, come on out. Be right with you, Doc. Just leaving the airlock. Doc, do you think they're frozen? Uh, I don't think the temperature has dropped far enough for that yet. Right, Doc, here I am. Good. Help me get them into the truck, Frank. There's room in the cargo section. They'll be comfortable enough there until we can get them back to the ship. Yes, so we'll take Mitch first. And go easy, Frank. We must damage his suit. Thanks, Lemmy. Now give me a hand with Jet, will you? Help me get him over to his bunk. Sure, Doc. That's it. Now, lay him down gently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. I'll get his suit off while you give Frank a hand with Mitch. 
Yes, Doc. All right, Frank boy. Over here. Blimey, these suits feel chilly, don't they? And look at the condensation on them. It's cold out there, Lemmy. Darn cold. And it'll stay that way until the sun rises again. Yeah, easy does it. That's it. Now, will you take his suit off or will I? You got those hot drinks Doc told you to have ready? Oh, of course I have. Well, then you better get them, Lemmy. I'll deal with Jet's suit. Right. I expect you could do with a drink yourself, couldn't you? I certainly could, but let's tend to Jet and Mitch first. Here you are, Doc. Thanks, Lemmy. Just put them down, will you? And leave them in the vacuum flask. Don't pour them yet. How are they, Doc? To me, they just seem to be asleep. Can't you wake them up? No, Lemmy, I can't. And until their temperature gets back to normal, I'm not even going to attempt to. Is it that low, then? Yes. Lower than I could possibly have imagined. Go on. Then, oh, aren't they likely to have frostbite or, or something? Strangely enough, except for the drop in body temperature and the deep sleep that's overtaken them, there seems to be nothing wrong. Huh. It's the case of Whitaker all over again. Whit? How do you mean? Oh, well, Frank here will know what I mean. Me, Doc? Yes, Frank. Remember less than a week after we took off on this trip how you woke to find Whitaker apparently asleep on his feet? Oh, will I ever forget it? Well, he was impossible to wake, too. It was hours before he came around. When he did, it was in his own good time, and not because of anything I'd been able to do for him. And I remember now, his temperature was that normally low. As low as Jets and Mitch's? Oh, no, Lemmy, not quite. But it might well have been. It was a couple of hours before I got to him. And by then, his temperature could have well started to arise again. And it continued to do so until it reached normal, and he woke up. Just as though he'd had nothing more than a good night's sleep. Yeah. And Jet and Mitch seem to be behaving in just the same way. Yeah. Well, I... Doc, they, they've been out in the cold. People's temperatures do drop, and they, they do get sleepy when they've been exposed to severe cold. Yes, Lemmy, but it wasn't that severe. Then why did they go into that stupor? Why did they collapse out there on the ice? If I knew the answer to those questions, Lemmy, I'd be glad to give them to you. But only Jet and Mitch know exactly what happened out there, and until they wake up, we can only guess at the truth. Hey, look, Frank. The fog's gone. It's as clear as crystal outside now. I wonder what caused it to come up so quick. And it didn't stay long, did it? Yeah, it must be something to do with a sudden drop in temperature that comes with the approach of nightfall. You think so? Seems more like a, a low cloud to me. Drifting by at ground level. Maybe, Lemmy. Hey, look at that star almost on the horizon. That's the Earth, isn't it? Yes, Lemmy. The Earth. The evening star of Mars. I wonder if anybody up there is looking at us right now. I expect so. But this part of the planet will soon be in total darkness and no longer visible to the people up there. It'll be the other side they'll be concentrating on. Yeah, it don't seem possible that that little disk of light could be covered with cities. Yeah. And in every city, thousands of houses. And in, in all them houses, millions of people. It makes you feel all peculiar inside, doesn't it? Yes. Shall we go over to the navigational telescope and take a closer look at home before she dips below the horizon? Hey, Frank, let me. Not now, mate. Doc's calling. Come in. Hey, Doc, the fog's completely cleared out there now. And Never uh, mind that, Lemmy. I think Jet's about to wake up. His temperature's almost back to normal and he was stirring a few moments ago. How about Mitch? Still sound asleep. Hello, Jet. Oh. Hello, Doc. Where am I? In the Discovery, lying on your own bunk. Well, how did I get here? Frank and I went out and brought you in. Mitch, too. What was I doing meanwhile? Sleeping, apparently. Sleeping? The last thing I remember, Mitch and I were outside, lost in a thick fog. That's right. And then we saw the ship's light and began to walk towards it, and then... And then what, Jet? Well, I'm not sure. I felt so terribly tired. We both felt so tired, you and Mitch lay down on the ice and fell asleep. And you slept soundly until now. But Jet. what was the light you saw, Jet? The light? Yes. At first you thought it was the light of this ship. But it was orange, not white. And far from guiding you here, it led you away from us. In completely the wrong direction. Yes, I remember now. When it shone on us, we felt warm. And it was that that made us so sleepy. Didn't you hear Lemmy and I calling you over the radio? In a vague kind of way, yes, I did. And why didn't you answer us? Instead of giving us a list of quotations about sleep. Did I? What were they? 
them. One was about sleep being beloved from pole to pole. And the other was about knitting. A sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. That's it. Strange I should remember that after all these years. Oh? I've completely forgotten it until now. Methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth doth murder sleep. The innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. <laughs> Funny I can remember that. I don't remember saying it when I was outside, though. Oh, gosh, I feel cold. Here you are, mate. You drink this. Oh, thanks, Lemmy. Jeff, what was the light you saw? The orange one? I don't know. We were so sure it was the light of the ship. Even when you got right up to it? Yes, Doc. It was about the same height from the ground. Did it throw a beam? A beam? Yeah. No, come to think of it, it didn't. Not a beam like the headlight of the ship. And that didn't strike you as strange? By that time, Doc, I felt so sleepy, I just didn't care about anything, so long as I could sleep. And how about when you did? Did you have any peculiar dreams? Like the one you had when Whitaker died? No, not like that. It, it was a pleasant dream. But you did dream. What about? I was walking across a hot, sandy desert. Yeah. An orange-colored sun was in the sky, and its rays permeated me with a soft warmth. Uh-huh. Then, suddenly, I topped a rise. I found myself gazing down at a shallow valley. It was so long, it stretched from horizon to horizon. It was filled with what appeared to be a forest of plants, like... Oh, like sticks of rhubarb, with blue-green leaves and reddish-purple stalks. But they were about six feet high. And they grew so thick, there couldn't have been more than a few inches between them. Then, right in the center of the valley was a city, built of... Oh, red stone or mud. I couldn't tell from where I was. All the houses were rectangular in shape, with flat roofs. And they were built terrace fashion, like those old pueblos you find in southwest America. Were there any people there? Well, if there were, I didn't see any. Well, the place seemed to be a ruin, and the rhubarb forest had grown right up to its walls. Oh, it was a walled city. Well, in a way, yes. How do you mean, in a way? Either it was walled or it wasn't. Well, what I took to be walls at first turned out to be the size of a colossal artificial plateau on which the city was built. Oh. The rhubarb had even got up there. I could see it growing on the rooftops. Seems to me you dreamt about Babylon and the Hanging Garden. Then I heard the voices. The voices? Go on, Jack. Oh, pathetic, wailing voices. Oh, they were dreadful to hear. It was as though they were crying out for help, for me to help them. Well, what else did they want? Well, they wanted me to take them somewhere. Home, they said. But you didn't see anybody? No, Doc. Only the city. And the blue and red forest waving in the gentle breeze. Mm. Oh, bloody... Of course you heard voices. It was me and Frank. What? Well, just before you woke up, we was watching the Earth sink below the horizon. And Frank said he'd like to take a look at Earth and home through the telescope before it dipped out of sight completely. You must have heard us, and our voices got all mixed up with your dream. Yes, I mean... Lemmy, that sounds plausible enough. Well, the dream was vivid enough. It seemed so real. Uh, but for those tragic voices coming from the city, it was so pleasant, so very pleasant. I was almost sorry to wake up, Doc, I can tell you. Well, that makes a change. Most of the dreams we've all been having up to now have been so horrible, you couldn't wake up fast enough. How's Mitch, Doc? Did he dream too? I don't know, Jet. He's not awake yet. Uh, pass me another drink, Lemmy. I still feel cold, deep down inside. Yes, mate. One cup of tea, coming up. from a dreamless sleep, half an hour later. And, as with Jet, seemed none the worse from his experience, except to complain of how cold his legs and feet were. But an hour after waking, he ceased to complain and was more his normal self. Frank, rather than risk venturing into the bitter cold of the Martian polar night, even to go the short distance between the airlock and the transport truck parked outside, spent the night with us. Next morning... When the early rising sun had rapidly warmed the thin atmosphere, Frank returned to his own ship to supervise the unloading of the equipment needed to carry the first party on its expedition down towards the Martian equator. An hour before sunset, all work ceased, and every man returned to his own ship to spend his second night on the Red Planet. On the third day, we were ready. The first expedition could now start out on its 3,000-mile journey. 
Hello, Space Fleet. Flagship calling freighter number two. Come in, please. Hello, Flagship. Space Fleet freighter number two here. Receiving you loud and clear. Hello, number two. How are things with you up there? Fine, thanks, Skipper. Oh, listen, number two. Yes, sir? Tomorrow morning, the first party will be on its way. It's time to bring the third ship down. Well, she's all ready. Just waiting for the word. You can descend as soon as your position in free orbit is favorable for making the landing. The boys can hardly wait. And by the time you get down, Doc, Lemmy, and I will be on our way in the land transport machines. Frank will be in charge while we're gone. Yes, sir. As soon as you've unloaded your cargo, you'll return to free orbit for another load and bring that down, too. Then Frank will start out after us with the second caravan, and you'll remain on the deck. Your ship will then become the main relay station between the land expedition and the rest of the fleet. I quite understand, Skipper. Pity we won't be down there in time to give you a send-off. Thanks, number two. Uh, And good luck with the landing. And good luck to you, too, sir. Thank you. Well, Mitch, I think it's about time we started. We're all ready, Jeff. Doc and Lemmy are out there aboard the tracks. Uh, Grimshaw. Sir. We're off. And we leave you in charge of the discovery. When number two gets down, one of his men will take over. And you can get back to number one and get ready to follow in our tracks with Frank's expedition in four or five days. Yes, sir, and good luck. Take care of yourselves. We will. We'll keep in touch. Now, let us out, will you? Airlock. Contact. Hello, Lemmy. Let me in, will you? Right. Here you are, Cobber. I thought Jet would be riding in this truck. <laughs> no, Lemmy. I'm afraid you'll have to put up with me for the first couple of hundred miles anyway. And then we'll change round. Now, shove over, mate, and let me get into the driving seat. Yeah, sure. I'll call up Jet, will you? See if he's ready to move off. Hello, Jet. You settled in yet? Hello, Lemmy. Ready to go whenever you are. You lead the way. Okay, Mitch. Start her up. Now, uh, let's take it slowly. <laughs> it's a long time since I handled one of these things. Let's see. Now, that's it. Now, power. Well, all okay in the motor department. Indicators all working. Break off. Away we go. And Jet's on his way, too. Look, he's falling in behind us. <laughs> Wacko. Well, Lemmy, this is it. Man's first exploration of Mars is about to begin. Now, take your last look at the discovery. You won't be seeing her for some months. How many miles are we going to cover on this trip? Oh, roughly about 7,000. Well, let's hope the trucks stand up to it. What do we do if we get a breakdown? <laughs> we can't ring up a garage and ask them to tell us thing, can we? <laughs> oh, Frank and his mechanics will only be a couple of days behind us. We just sit tight until he rolls up. And how far do we go before we leave this ice behind and get down to where the climate is warmer? Oh, about 400 miles. Maybe a little less. Oh, the weight we're travelling, it would well, take us about uh, three and a half days, including the stops at night. Well, that's about it, Lenny. I don't think you can expect any change in the scenery for at least that time. And what will it change to? Well, that's what we'd like to know. That's what we're going to find out. And so we set out across the glaring white wastelands of the south polar ice cap towards the warmer climes of the temperate zone nearer the equator. The grey transport trucks, looking almost black against the gleaming white of the ice, resembled two lines of beetles, slowly wending their way across a barrel of flour. There were three trucks in each caravan. First came the tractor, with its roomy, airtight cabin, in which sat its crew of two men, one to drive, the other to navigate. In tow was the living quarters vehicle, a huge tank-like machine which, in its base, carried the food, water, surveying tools, spare clothing and other personal equipment essential for the trip. On the upper deck, hermetically sealed to the circular platform, were the living quarters themselves, looking like transportable Eskimo igloos. And finally came the cargo truck, carrying the necessary fuel, oxygen tanks and other equipment too bulky to be stored beneath the living quarters. Soon the two great spaceships had been left far behind until finally they disappeared from view over the horizon and all contact with them, except by radio, was gone. We were alone, just the four of us, two in each caravan, slowly plowing our way across the great white desert. That first day we covered 160 miles. At sunset we stopped the trucks and prepared to bed down for the night. Darkness fell, 
and with it came the bitter cold of the Martian night. It was so cold outside that the heaters had to be turned on to full pressure to keep us from freezing, even within our double-skinned living quarters. All night, the two caravans stood under the black, diamond-studded sky while we slept. Next morning, half an hour after sunrise, we were on our way again, and by noon had covered another 70 miles. Hello, Mitch. Jet calling. Jet, Jet. Hearing you. We're going to halt. Stop your truck. We'll come up alongside you. Right. What's up, Mitch? Something wrong? Not that I'm aware of, Lemmy. Yeah, we'll stop here for food. Food? Oh, come to think of it, I can't do it a bite. As soon as you've had your meal, Mitch, join me outside, will you? And bring the number one kit with you. How about me, Jet? Can I come out too? Uh, not this time, Lemmy. Maybe next stop. Just my luck. I'd like to go out and stretch my legs a bit. Oh, never mind, Lemmy. By way of compensation, I'll get the meal ready and you can take it easy. Oh, it's very nice of you, mate. Hello, Landfleet. Polar Base calling. Come in, please. Take it easy, did you say, Mitch? <laughs> Hello, Frank. Barney, dear. What can I do for you? Number two's on its way. Present line of flight indicates she'll pass right over you. You should see her. Oh? How are she? Two thousand feet. Oh, then we could hardly miss her, could we? Thanks for the news, Frank. We'll keep a lookout. Hello, Jet. Let me hear. Just had a call from base. Yes, Lemmy. I heard it. You want to talk to number two? I can hook you up. Uh, no, Lemmy. Not now. I'll talk to him after he's landed. Right. Yeah, wait a minute. That's number two approaching already. Yeah, Lemmy. Oh, she's traveling pretty fast, isn't she? That's just what I was thinking. Oh, for well, us, like a streak of lightning. Happy landings, boys, and keep your noses in at night. It's perishing cold down here. Hello, Jet. Number two was pretty low and travelling fast, too. Yes, Mitch. I suppose she's all right. Oh, they've got plenty of time to slow down to landing speed before they get to base. Uh, tell Lemmy to keep in contact and let me know when number two touches down. Right. Okay, Lemmy, let me in, will you? Yes, mate. Oh, thanks, Cobby. Well, what'd you find out there? Oh, we weren't looking for much, Lemmy. Just dug up a couple of samples of the soil, that's all. Oh. Well, when do we move off? Whenever you're ready. Uh, you drive, will you? I have to mark up the map, show the precise spot where the samples came from. Right. Motor on. Hold on to your helmet. Here we go. Any word from base about number two? Yes, mate. She made a safe landing and the boys are already unloading her. Hello, base. Land fleet calling. Come in, please. Hello, Lemmy. Hearing you. Routine check. Coming up. I've now been traveling two and a half days and have covered three to seven miles. I've now stopped for midday meal. We'll continue journey northwards within one hour. Check. How about you? You got anything to report? Number two is on his way down with the second load of supplies. Should be landing within two hours and the ship should pass right over you again. When do you start out after us, Frank? Oh, it shouldn't be long now. Pretty well everything we need is already loaded in our trucks and the tractor's all hooked up. As soon as number two gets down again, we'll transfer the final load and with luck we'll start out at dawn tomorrow. Good show, mate. We'll keep a lookout for number two. And let you know as soon as we sight her. Thanks, Lemmy. Hear from you later, then. Yes, mate. Uh, put Mitch on, will you, please? Hello, Jeff. Mitch, have you looked towards the north recently? No, why? A few minutes ago, Doc noticed what we think to be a cloud bank on the horizon. Would you take a look out of the cabin window, see if you can see it? Yeah, sure. Uh, hold on, will you? Where did he say it was? Uh, to the north. Well, it looks pretty clear to me. The ice stretches clear to the horizon, as flat as a pancake, and... Hey, wait a minute, I think I do see it. There's uh, a lighter tinge of mauve, like a thin, wavy line. Can you see it? Yeah. Hello, Jet. Yes, we can see it. Is it a cloud bank? How should I know? That's why we wanted your opinion. Or maybe it's another of them fogs coming up. That's what we thought, and it's lying directly in our path. You mean we'll have to pass through it? Well, not necessarily. It may disperse as rapidly as the other did and be gone long before we reach it. Uh, have you finished your meal? Yes, Jet. Just before I called up Frank. Then switch on your motor and let's get going. I want to get as close to that whatever it is as we can before nightfall. Should reach it by then, Jet. It can't be more than 40 miles away. If we do, all the better. Then at least we'll know exactly what we may have to face tomorrow. Now, let's get going, Mitch. Cruising speed will be 50 miles an hour. Hello, Landry. Polar base calling. Come in, please. Hello, Frank. What's the panic? Put me out to Jet, Lemmy. There's trouble. Hang on a minute, boy. Hello, Jet. Frank's calling. There's something wrong up at base. Hello, Frank. Jet here. What's up? It's number two, Skipper. She's in difficulty. Well, we were thinking it was about time she passed over us. What's wrong? I wish I knew. I was in radio contact with her on the ship-to-ship -ship system until five minutes ago, but now I can't get any reply to my call. What was her position when you last heard from her? Fifty miles directly north of you. Well, keep calling her, Frank. 
Meanwhile, I'll get Lemmy to tune into the ship-to-ship frequency. See if we can pick it up. Okay, Skipper. Switching over now. Did you hear all that, Lemmy? Yes, Jet. Just looking you up. Hello, number two. Polar base calling. I've lost contact with you. Come in, please. And there's Frank calling now. Can you hear him? Yes, Lemmy. Thank you. Hello, base number two calling. Trying to contact you. And there's number two. He is answering. But he's very faint, Lemmy. Too faint for Frank to pick up. Hello, number two. Base calling. I've not heard from you for seven minutes. Come in, please. He's not hearing him either. Lemmy. Yes, Jet? Hook me up to the transmitter. Let's see if he can hear us. Right. Transmitter on. Hello, number two. Landfleet calling. We are receiving your strength, too. Can you hear us? Hello, Landfleet. The ship, I, I can't control it. I'll have to make a forced landing. What's the matter with the ship? What's wrong? I don't know. I, I was circling to investigate a mysterious orange light. An orange light? And there's a noise. It, a, it, a noise? What we heard when we made the first landing. Oh, I'll, I'll have to put it down. I'll never make peace. It's the only way I can hope to save the ship. I'm... I'm so sleepy. Sleepy? Oh, blimey. Hello, number two. You must not go to sleep. You must stay awake. Do you hear? We're, we're almost on the deck now. About to land. She's difficult to control. Oh, my God. Hello, number two. Hello. He must have crashed. How far north of us did Frank say she was? Fifty miles. If we increase speed to twenty miles an hour, we could cover that distance before sunset. That doesn't mean we'll find her. Not before dark, anyway. But there's a chance. Yeah, and there's a chance of burning up the motors, too, with a load we're dragging behind us. That's a risk we'll have to take. If that ship is wrecked, her crew will be in dire need of help. Okay, Jeff. All right, Lemmy. Turn on the juice. It's a race against time. <laughs> 